Prime Minister, thank you. Um, this, as Mike pointed out, this could not have happened without you, and we're very grateful. Thank you. Uh, we will take a look at, perhaps at China and America first, but then we'll come back to the idea of Singapore as a role model. And just so people know, we will have questions from the audience at the end. Um, as you've already heard quite a lot of at the beginning of this dinner, a great inevitable theme of this meeting has been the issue of China and America, and especially the idea of the current tension. You, you, are, in, you are friends of both but you're also in the middle, which is sometimes an awkward place. And I wondered, how much do you think this is just a trade dispute, and how much is this a symptom of a broader breakdown? Well, I think there certainly are trade issues which need to be addressed. China entered the WTO around 2000. At that time, they were 4% of the world GDP. They are now 15. Their status of development is much more now than they used to be, although they take pains to emphasize that they are still a very much a developing country. But their impact on the world and on their trading partners is completely different from what it used to be. So the dispensation which was reached, the terms on which they entered the WTO, need to be brought up to date. And issues which have come up which need to be tackled. So I think there are real trade issues. But it goes beyond trade. It goes beyond trade because if the trade issues are not well tackled, you lead to broader conflicts over investments, over currency, over many other things which will stoke mutual suspicions and distrust, and that can lead to a lot of trouble. And where do you see, where do you see the core of that distrust? Is it well, the, 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 the most apocalyptic view is that the Chinese will think some Chinese will think that the Americans want to frustrate their emergence in the world to their rightful place. And some Americans will think the Chinese want to supplant America's role as the hyperpower. We, I mean, it, there are shades of grey, but I'm putting it at the extreme. But, and how much does that fit, maybe first, with America? You, you lived in Kansas, famously? Yes, I have spent a year in Kansas, uh, Wizard of Oz country. <laughs> And but, but is it's, that it's uh, quite a quite a remarkable experience. First, you meet people who are warm and the salt of the earth, and what America is mostly made of. But secondly, you realize how far away the rest of the world is, including the two east and west coasts. Yes, and China much further. China much further. In those days, the Soviet Union equally far away, and yet not irrelevant because the farmers sell to them. And do you think that that America that you know, do you think that America is determined to stop China becoming the world's biggest economy? I don't think that it has reached that point. I don't necessarily think that for the mass of Americans, China is a top item on their agenda mm. on, or in their mind share. But I think that if the issues are not well handled, you could lead to very strong stereotypes being formed of one another which will have policy consequences. There are a lot of people here from America who may have a sort of, I suppose, a sense of trepidation about China. And it strikes me that Singapore has always played an outsized role in China's development. I remember coming here in 2010 to see you and your father, and then the meetings being delayed suddenly by a couple of days because a then, to me, unknown man called Xi Jinping had just been made, joined the military commission, which made him the heir apparent in China. And one of the first things he wanted to do was to come here and see you and your father. What, how do you, so you have played this role in China's development. Which way do you see China going? I think you overstate our role. They yes. see us as a bonsai tree model of what China <laughs> is. People, people can take a bonsai tree a long way. Well, <laughs> so it's intriguing to look at and to scrutinize, but then you ask yourself, but we are so many hundreds of times bigger, what of this is relevant? and hopefully some ineffable essence of it is useful to them and they take it back and transmute it and it may take root in China. But at that time, people saw China heading, people talked about Singapore as a sort of model, that something that was more democratic, but also had different, took an Asian view of the way the world would go. I don't, Do you think, still see China? I don't think they see us as uh, the way China will, will evolve. What they are intrigued in is, how, it is pos how is it possible in Singapore to have free and open elections regularly, multi-party politics, 
and one party remain in power for such a long time. It's strange, that. <laughs> <laughs> and it is strange, and it is not a given outcome for Singapore either. But just pushing you a bit on China, which way do you, if you look forward to China, say, 10 years from now, what, what kind of China do you see then? I think the economy will have to develop considerably more. Their engagements in the region will be even more significant than now. Already they are the biggest trading partner for nearly all the countries in, in Asia, uh, from Japan to Korea to the ASEAN countries to Australia, New Zealand. All the countries, including all the American allies. So they are a big fat in the world for us. And all of us would like to see China prospering and us prospering with it. And we hope that will be the case 10 years from now. Uh, the Chinese will emphasize to you that they face many domestic issues, not least of which is income inequality between the rich and the poor people and the rich and the poor regions. And they have to make some considerably difficult reforms, economic and social, and even political updating, in order to keep on course so that we can continue to see an exponential trajectory. And you obviously, you talked about their domestic priority, but you are also just, I think you just become chair of ASEAN. We have been chair this year, yes. And, but you look at all the countries of Southeast Asia, they face to some degree, I was talking to somebody earlier, they face some degree of choice about which side they might be seen on, or are they all trying to stay in the middle? No, it depends. The countries have different strategic perspectives. If you are um, uh, in Indochina, for example, I think China will loom very large, but the responses will be different. Vietnam is trying to maintain an independent position. The Cambodians or the Laotians will see China as a very big source of um, aid, support, cooperation. The Thais will uh, be very careful to make friends with all the powers that be, and China will be one of the important ones. Uh, if you look at the countries which, are, which have issues with China, for example, over the South China Sea, Philippines, Malaysia, Brunei, uh, it's more complicated, but neither do they wish to collide because they know that it's a broad account and there are other things to take into consideration. If you look at Singapore, we have no stake in the disputes in the South China Sea, but we do have an interest both in China's prosperity and stability, as well as in the region's openness and security. And that depends on both China and the United States. Do you worry at all about the rivalries, the bigger rivalries, spreading into smaller ones? You look at, I look at Southeast Asia and you have some disputes with Malaysia, you have some with Indonesia, there's a nasty election uh, going well, on. There. Neighbours are never without complexities. Even America and Canada have interesting conversations from time <laughs> to time. So it is not surprising. We have been born to be here. This is what God gave us. And they gave us this, they gave us our people, they gave us our neighbours. We don't choose our neighbors. We are blessed with two bigger than us, and we get on well with them. <laughs> but all the generally. same, generally. And there will always be issues which will come up, and we have to deal with them and in a way which is constructive, win-win, and respects the core interests of both countries. But the fact you've just had one election in Malaysia, and we've now got this one coming up in Indonesia, yes. is, that a, is that a big factor in the way you see this particular uh, region? Well, elections happen every five years, so each time we look at the outcome. In Malaysia, the outcome was a surprise uh, for many Malaysians, and I think many Singaporeans didn't expect it to. But we will work with Dr. Mahathir and his administration. We've worked with him before when he was Prime Minister. In Indonesia, we have had a good relationship with a series of Indonesian presidents, uh, Megawati, uh, SBY, Ms. Yudhoyono, now Mr. Jokowi. Mm. And if he's re-elected, we will continue. If somebody else is elected, well, we will develop a relationship with him. Does it strike you, though, that many people might have thought that at a time when you have this sort of superpower tensions, you might expect those slightly smaller countries to begin to kind of form closer alliances, whilst in, to some degree you seem to be bickering a slightly no, more. No, there's some of that. There's some of that. It would, be, uh, it would be less than candid if I said that ASEAN is impervious to gravitational and tidal forces, and different countries in ASEAN feel them differently. And therefore, in our discussions, you have to make allowances for that and understand that we start off with different perspectives on the world, 
and therefore the area where we can develop a consensus. ASEAN view uh, is not the whole universe, but some subset thereof, which we try to make as big as possible. You have the big meeting here next week. E and even, even the EU has these arguments amongst yes. themselves, dealing with China, dealing with America, and you have to accommodate these different views. One last thing on that. You have both China and America, neither Trump nor Mr. Xi are coming to, to the ASEAN meeting. C a, President Xi doesn't usually doesn't come to the it. ASEAN meetings. The Premier always comes. It used to be Wen Jiabao, and now it's uh, Li Keqiang, and Li Keqiang will be coming. He's making a, an official visit here. Uh, President Trump is unable to come this year. He's sending uh, Vice President Pence. We look forward to receiving him. Another big theme in this particular conference has been the issue of governance. And as I said earlier, people, rightly or wrongly, look to Singapore as a place which is good at government. It's good at cities. It's good at many things. And you have managed to do it with a, very, a state which is a tiny proportion of most Western states, and yet you deliver health care and education, which normally comes at the top of the league tables. Do you still think that sort of Asian model, that Singaporean model, can offer some examples, even if it's a, a bonsai tree? Well, we hope people find us interesting. Uh, the solutions we have, other countries may or may not prefer to apply. For example, in our health care system, one of our cardinal principles is that People take personal responsibility for some for their health, and the government pays a large part of it in various subsidies, but we do expect some co-payment from everybody unless you are very poor. And that's uh, not a principle accepted everywhere. The National Health in Britain explicitly uh, refuses to do that. But do you think that's a principle which in general will spread as other, particularly other emerging countries begin to build I think it's path-dependent. We, we were able to get here because we built up our system progressively from the time when we were not so well off. And as we became well off and as incomes rose, we were able to put aside substantial proportion of that increase in income every year. And it was 7, 8, 10, sometimes 15 percent of income, of wage increases, into a compulsory savings fund, mm. the Central Provident Fund. And therefore, we have this institution which people have accepted. And you can use that fund for health care, for housing. We use it also for tertiary education for your children. And, uh, and we are happy with that. If you haven't built that up during a long period of development, and overnight you say, I'm now going to hypothecate one third of your income and put it into a compulsory savings fund for your old age so that you will not retire poor, I think a lot of people will get angry with you straight away. What about education? If you look at education, the thing which strikes me about Singapore's example is how relatively easy or not, not how unstructural it is. You tend to just fire bad teachers and No, no, we don't ones. just fire bad teachers. We counsel them, we train them, we improve and them, and finally, them. if it can't be helped, we'll encourage them to find something which suits them better. Yes. <laughs> but that is an unusual... <laughs> That is still an unusual thing, certainly. No, in the I United think you States. have to hold people responsible. Otherwise, how do you know they are working or not working? We didn't start off like this. We, we began with a system where you joined as, the, as a teacher, and then you were on a scale. And every year, your wages would go up a certain proportion. And then at certain points in your career, some uh, inspector of education will come and sit in on your class and say, well, you can cross the bar. And then you'll keep on uh, being elevated gradually until you retire. And it worked like that for a long time, and I think there were a lot of good teachers under that system, but it wasn't really a fair system or one which got the best out of them. So eventually we were able to reach the point where we had proper promotions, we had proper career advancements, and we were able to develop the teachers, not just pay them and sack them, but develop the teachers so that you can become a master teacher, you spend your lifetime in a classroom, you have a passion for it. You can become a, an educational leader, you can become a head of department or a principal of a school or principal of a cluster of schools. Or you can be a specialist and you develop curriculums and you write textbooks and you follow your passion and we will invest in you and you, get a, you can do a master's, a PhD, and we want people who are passionate to do this. But this, doesn't it surprise you? Every single government I've spoken to around the world sends people to Singapore to come and look at this, and then they don't copy it. Well, you've got to persuade your teachers' union to agree. Yes, that's... 
And you've also get, got to persuade the public to accept a system where uh, the government takes a very leading role. And in many countries, it's diversified. In America, the counties look after the education system. So you may or may not have the resources to do this. Some people, when they look at Singapore, they, they give it all this credit on government, but they do point out that you have got an aging population and you, you've now got at least a little bit of an immigration problem. Is that? Well, we have an aging population. Our, our median age is now 41 um, and growing. And if you look at the proportion of people who are 65 and above, we are now maybe one in seven. By 2030, we may be one in three, something like that. So on the one hand, we are growing older. On the other hand, people are healthier and are able to work longer. So I don't think living shorter is a good solution. <laughs> the, other, the, other, the other part of that is to have a relatively tough government that is prepared to tell people to work longer. No, we can't tell people to work longer. I think people naturally wish to be able to work longer, provided the incentives are there and the encouragement is provided. And you make it feasible. One of the things we do, do and uh, we, we have, one of the ways we have intervened is we have a subvention to employers for the older workers to encourage them to keep them on the payroll. And the subvention goes to help to pay for their compulsory CPF sa savings. And therefore, it lessens the burden on the employers. It gives the workers an incentive to keep on working. And I think they're happy to keep on working because they keep active, they're doing something useful. And uh, it keeps them mentally alert. And immigration? Which is immigration becoming... is a vexed subject in every country. Um, people, it's partly economics. People feel worried about their, whether their jobs will be uh, taken, will, will be supplanted, or maybe at least their incomes will be affected. But it's more than that. There's also a sense of identity and what sort of society you're in and whether these are familiar faces, familiar sounds, familiar customs or not. And it's very difficult to not have those issues arise. We have um, a large foreign worker population here. Um, we have, they, they are one third of our workforce, which means for every two Singaporean workers, there's one foreign yeah. worker in Singapore. He could be running a bank, he could be a construction worker, he could be a cleaner um, on the streets. But that's not a small number. But those are, most of those are transient. They come, they work when they finish their, uh, their whatever the economic activity here. One day they expect to go home. Uh, we do have immigration in the sense of people coming in and staying, and the numbers are not small. Every year we have about 35,000 um, resident babies born in Singapore. Every year we accept about 30,000 permanent residents. That means people given effectively a green card. Mm. So it's almost one in two. Do you, do you think any country, I'm intrigued given the amounts you study other governments, is there, is there any country you think that does immigration well? If you listen to all the debates today, you would have heard the words immigration come up repeatedly. I think different countries have made different trade-offs. Some have been very open and have benefited considerably from it. America is one of them. It's now become a hot political issue, but nevertheless, that you are able to attract talent from all over the world to Silicon Valley, to your universities, to your businesses, MNCs, to have an environment where people can come in and live and work in America and make America vibrant. That's a tremendous plus which you have, which America has, which China doesn't have, Japan doesn't have. Even the Europeans don't have to the same degree. If you look at Japan, they've made a different accommodation. They've, it's a close, much more closed society. The immigrants who come in, they try and get them to learn Japanese before you let them work. They do that to nurses, for example. So it's a more cohesive, tightly knit society, but on the other hand, much less conscious of the outside world and how things look outside of your own closed environment. So that's the trade-off. And now they're having to shift that trade-off because uh, the numbers are telling on them and their population is falling. We are trying to tread a very careful balance to have enough of the next generation being our own kids born to us, but some significant contribution also from people who come in and who can make, cast their lot with us 
and become Singaporeans. So you deliberately time. make the choice that the native-born side of the equation must be satisfied to some extent. It's not that you want to be satisfied. I think we are trying very hard to have enough native-born in the next generation. And that is very hard because to do that, every, on average, every woman needs 2.1 kids. One for herself, one for her husband, and 0.1 just for contingencies. <laughs> but we don't have that. We have less than 1.2. Those who are getting married, they're producing two kids. But, but one third aren't getting married, and very few people have babies outside wedlock in Singapore, just as well. And so on average, my statistics don't add up. <laughs> exactly. Well, I'm sure you can make it change. I asked you a degree. No, I'm not sure I can make it change. I've tried very hard. <laughs> You could tell Singaporeans to go out and create babies tonight. <laughs> we have tried that too. <laughs> so, I've, asked you, I've asked you about the Singaporean model, uh, partly for a parochial reason, that there is a, a small, very old European country with which you're somewhat familiar, that some people there hope will become Singapore on the Thames after Brexit. I don't think you will have... Do you have any views on no, that? No, I don't think you'll have London by the Merlion. <laughs> yes. It's not possible. I think we are very different. You should different. explain that the Merlion is the, the, the symbol, Merlion symbol is just of down, the, down the, the, the coast from here, the mouth of the Singapore River. is an icon of Singapore. And uh, we travelers come here, and this is one of the things you see. Is, it's what Singapore is. I don't think Singap Singapore can become like London, or London can become like Singapore. Yeah, the histories are completely different. We are small. We are in the middle of a very open um, and very, um, how shall I put it, uh, an environment which is much less predictable even than Britain's environment in Europe. Mm. Britain has developed a, a system of state welfare, of government rule in the system where you have, the government accounts for 40-45% of the GDP. The Singapore government accounts for 16% of the GDP, maybe 17. Mm. So to say that you're going to become like Singapore, are you going to give up two-thirds of your government spending and state pensions and national health? We trade with the EU. They are a significant partner to us, highly valued, maybe about 20% of our trade. Britain has the EU with 70% of your trade. So unless you tow that septed isle over here. That sounds, that sounds a very polite way of saying that Singapore, Singapore, Singapore on the Thames is a pipe dream that will never happen. I, I, you will have to find a different way to prosper having made the decision to leave the EU. Uh, but I don't think, and maybe, maybe if you look at Singapore, you might think there are some ideas you can use, and we hope so. But I don't think you can take one society solution and just plonk it on a different would you, society. Would you, would you do a, a, a trade deal with the new independent regime? Yes, we would. In the first instance, what we will do what the jargon now calls a short-form deal, which means whatever we have with the EU, we will port over and we will continue to let it apply with Britain for some time because basically not much will have changed in Britain's circumstances domestically until such time as we can work out a more substantive agreement with Britain, which in due course we hope we will. Can I ask you, can I ask you a bit about your own future and what happens? You, you've had a very good year. You've had the Kim-Trump summit. You've had all these, had this um, conference. You've been the star of Crazy Rich Asians. There's a whole variety of things that has been good for Singapore. I don't, but... I don't think they give us delusions of grandeur. <laughs> <laughs> I, Some... I, I, the Kim Trump summit, they were looking for a venue which they, both sides could trust and rely upon don't, to deliver. Don't, don't, and don't we, knock that idea. It worked with us as well. <laughs> well, and, and they came. So we're, we're happy that this, we hosted the summit. We hope it makes some contribution to peace and reconciliation in the Korean Peninsula. Results really yet to be seen. Uh, crazy rich Asians have nothing to do with us. <laughs> we don't live like that. And I think it would be disastrous if Singaporeans get the idea that that is the way we ought to live. But all the same, you, you are having a good year. Next year, next year is Raffles, the, the 200th anniversary of Stanford Raffles Arrival, coming here. Yes. Why not? Would that be a reason to bring the election forward? You have the possibility of an election uh, in 2021. Well, it's always possible. There are many reasons to bring elections forward or not. So we'll see. <laughs>
Yeah, well, you're learning the art. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask you you've, one last thing on yourself? You've talked about um, not going on beyond 70. You're yes. 60 yourself. You, I'm 66. 66, I'm sorry. And you are, but you've been in politics, your father's in politics. Are any of the next generation of Lees thinking about it? And, what would, you, and would you recommend politics in the modern age to anybody? Well, none of them have shown any interest in coming into politics of my sons or daughter. Um, I mean, they're entitled to, but I don't think it is likely that they will uh, feel the same compulsion which I did, that it, it was something which you had a duty to do. I mean, they have their own responsibilities and careers, and I'm sure they will be good Singaporean citizens and make contributions in their own ways. But uh, I think uh, it, uh, it would be unkind for me to add more burden on them. <laughs> it's difficult enough for them carrying my name. But do you, think, do you think the job of even running a country as orderly as Singapore has got much more difficult over the 14 years that you have done it? I think it becomes more complicated. Certainly the social media makes things uh, very different. And it's not just that you have more news going around, but you have more fake news and you have uh, opinions which can overnight crystallize and uh, it may or may not be based on fact. And suddenly you are having to react to them. It's ridiculous. I mean, one night you go to sleep, all is well. Next morning somebody is overreacted to a rumor. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people have become agitated. And then you've got to chase your tail to, to put it away. And it's a completely different kind of environment. And we were thinking about a long-term plan and to stay on course. You have to be able to deal with all these buffetings which will beset you ceaselessly. But does that make long-term strategic thinking much, much harder for politicians of any sort? I think it will certainly leave you less time to think what your long-term intentions will be it also makes it harder for you to get people to focus on the long term and to believe that, in fact, you have a workable scheme to get from here to there. Because every day you are chasing a new rabbit. Prime Minister, wait, I said we would offer the, to the floor the chance to ask questions. Um, I think you will put your hand up and there is a paddle and microphones to ask the questions. You've stunned them into silence. I can't see if there's... I think there's a hand at the back. I'm sorry, we're somewhat in the dark up here, so we're looking towards... There's somebody pointing, I think. There's one Apologies. there in the back. Somebody's number eight. Thank you so much for this conversation. Mina al the editor-in-chief of The National from the United Arab Emirates. I just wanted to ask you, we've had so many conversations today about the changes, the disruptions that are coming with technology. You've alluded to social media and the changes in terms of the media landscape. How can you do long-term planning when there's leapfrogging with technology going ahead, especially what would be your advice for young people who are thinking about their career choices with this disruption? Thank you. I think you can only plan in broad terms where you want to go and what are the major pieces which you want to put in place. And then you have to leave a lot of space for the economy to develop, for people to pursue their passions, and for technology to unfold. But you do have to do things with a long-term perspective. For example, education is a long-term venture. Do, we don't know what jobs we'll be doing 10, 20 years from now, but we do know that we have to enable people to not only to do the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, but basic skills of analysis, basic skills of understanding the world, science, maths, and to be able to make sense of what's happening around them and to relearn things as they go along. That's one thing which you must do over the long term. I think if you're looking at uh, national issues, um, if you're looking, putting into place um, social, social safety nets, you also have to plan long term. 
For example, healthcare. To build up a healthcare system takes years. To plan ahead and have healthcare financing so that when people grow old, you'll be able to provide for their needs. That's a long-term requirement. Then, if you're talking about physical infrastructure, that's another thing which you need to do whatever happens in the world. You need to build an airport which is you know, on a different scale from what you have. You want to rebuild your city so that a hundred years from now, Singapore doesn't just look like a museum piece. Or you must start planning now and implement over 50, 70, 100 years. These are things which you have to do even though you don't know which way the world necessarily will go. You don't know whether there'll be war or peace. You don't know how fast climate change is going to hit us. But you can't say, therefore, I sit down and, well, I'll just think about next week and next year. And we have to get our people to think in those terms and to realize that even as we deal with immediate issues, which are pressing, for example, whether jobs are going to be lost, whether people have to find new vocations even within the next four, three, four, five years, that we have to think longer term because we have to think for our grandchildren and for our grand and great grandchildren. Otherwise, when it comes to their generation, they will not remember us kindly. I think the lady was asking a little bit about industrial policy, which is another thing. Industrial which policy have... is that's, that's harder to think to, to do very, very long term. But I think there are certain things which you can do to build up. For example, 15 years ago, we started to invest in uh, biomedical research. And we built up the capabilities. We brought in scientists. Many of them were from abroad. We trained our own, started training our own scientists, sending people on uh, degree programs, PhD programs, building up research institutes, bringing in c companies which were in biomedicine, some pharmaceuticals, some others doing biomedical devices. And over 15, 20 years now, I think we are beginning to see results. I wouldn't say we've got full uh, payback, but it is showing results, and it shows that you have to have a certain patience and persistence, persevere, and adjust as you go along. And eventually, you get something. It's not so easy to say what the next big thing will be. I mean, people talk about AI, they talk about, bit, about uh, blockchain, and you get all kinds of buzzwords which come up and catch the wind nowadays. And some of them will be the big thing, but you're not quite sure which ones. And we have to, be, we have to evaluate it quite soberly, I suppose, the way venture capital funds will evaluate promising projects. One more question. There's a, there's a hand just there. Number three. Uh, Jim McGregor from APCO in China. We've been having um, quite extended conversations here about the U.S.-China trade war, how to bring this to some kind of a close that works for both sides and also prevents um, you know, a lot of problems for economies and populations around the world. Um, you and your father have advised a lot of governments over the years, and Xi Jinping came here to get your advice. If Donald Trump and Xi Jinping were sitting at that table in front of you, what would you tell them to do to fix this? <laughs> I would be very hesitant to be at that, such a table. <laughs> <laughs> Xi, Jin, Xi Jinping didn't come here to get advice. He came here as, because we had good relations. He wanted to develop the relations. And I think he had some warm feelings for Singapore because he had visited Singapore previously when he was in Xiamen as an official. And we had good cooperation with China, and there were things we wanted to do together. But I think between China and America, the trade issues are genuine ones. I think the trade deficit is on top of Mr. Trump's mind, but the economists will tell you the trade deficit is really a manifestation of other macroeconomic problems and not a matter of trade um, restraints or lack of trade openness. That has to be dealt with separately. But issues with trade which the American business people have, for example, on intellectual property, for example, on where they can invest, for example, on uh, um, what rules pertain to them as opposed to um, 
Chinese state-owned enterprises particularly. These are things which can be put on the table and discussed, and uh, something can be worked out. Trade negotiators are skilled at doing this, and they make a living of this. But both sides must want to reach a deal, and then it can be worked out. And I think in the last two years, if I read just going on the public media, uh, several times they came close to reaching a deal, but ultimately it was not signed off at the top level. So that, I mean, these are things which uh, the leaders of the two countries have to decide what they want to do. And if it cannot be worked out, then I think you really want to keep it from boiling over, respond in a restrained way, and try to keep things going and prevent this from poisoning the overall relationship. Because even between America and China, there are so many things where you have to work together, otherwise you're not going to get anywhere, starting with North Korea. That's another question. I think. Mr. Prime Minister, um, most people would agree that America... Sorry, who are you? May I? <laughs> oh, I'm, Ro I'm Ronnie Chan. I, I think you recognize me, but anyway. <laughs> I couldn't see you. Hello. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, Ronnie Chan from Hong Kong. Most people will agree that America was founded in isolationism rather than internationalism. The fact that America is internationalist, it's just because it has been so in the last 70 some years. But you have Monroe Doctrine, they didn't join the, the, the League of Nations. Up to today, they still don't pay the United Nations dues for 20 some years. Nobody dared to say a word. And then in the last 20, 30 years, it seems that America is going back to that habit. And Trump certainly exacerbated that process. What will the new world order look like with America retreating? And how will that affect Singapore and this part of the world? How do you survive in a world where America is retreating and so very different from the last 70 years? I, I don't think America is retreating. I think America is rethinking its role, speaking, saying America very broadly because this is not a universal attitude in America, but certainly the administration is rethinking America's role in the world. Up to now, America has been such a dominant player in the world economy that it has felt that it is in its interest to provide global public goods. In other words, to have the most open economy and therefore foster prosperity around the world, to, have, to maintain the peace in the Asia-Pacific, in uh, Europe, in the Middle East, pour blood and treasure, and therefore maintain security and stability around the world. And the world has prospered greatly, and America with it. But now that America is maybe 20 plus percent of the world's GDP, when after the war they were perhaps half, depending on what, whose calculation you believe, they're asking themselves, should I do this or should I not put America first and deal one on one? And each time I deal one on one, America will, chances are, will be bigger than the other party, and I'll get a better deal. So instead of dealing with Mexico and Canada, I'll settle with Mexico first. Now, Canada, would you like to settle? Next, Japan, will you like to settle? Next, Europe, will you like to settle? Well, America is entitled to take such a position, but if you work like that, it will be a very different global environment because there's nobody who's in a position to take on the role which the U.S. has hitherto played. And if the arrangement is going to be bilateral and each time it's a trial of strength, whose arm wrestling is stronger? I think that's a very different kind of world which, in which it's not only small countries which will feel uncomfortable. And we hope it doesn't go that way. America is still, has still a huge interest in stability, in prosperity, in global economic integration, in having an environment where its companies can operate freely and access markets, whether it's in China or India or South America or in Europe. And that depends on a multilateral global order where there's some weight and authority and respect given to supranational institutions like the UN, like the World Bank, like the IMF. 
And it doesn't sell very well during primaries or midterm elections, but uh, I think that's what has benefited America for two generations plus since the war, and I think will continue to benefit the U.S. for a long time to come. And I hope that it will be able to be sustained even though the overall balance of weight is shifting. Maybe one more question. Because, because actually, you may think that others are catching up and, and maybe hoping to overtake you, and I'm sure there are many which will think that they may want to overtake where the United States is. But it is not a foregone conclusion that it will happen. And you really ought to work on the basis that America is confident, it has been able to reinvent itself, it has had many ups and downs before, and as your presidents always used to say, nobody has won by betting against the U.S. First of all, uh, I introduce myself, Douglas Xu, from Taiwan, Far Eastern Group, and Asia Cement. I have met you many times before. Hello, Douglas. Thank you for participating. I wanted to bring up an issue which is not so related to all the economic and all the politics things. It's a very personal thing. Uh, I know all your family members. There seems to be some bickering over how to handle Li Guangyao, his home and his memory and all this. A humble person with Chinese philosophy, uh, thinking and all that. His house should be kept. His house should be remembered. We all respect Li Guangyao and he should be remembered, should not be destroyed, even though that may be his wish. He should be remembered and uh, he's a proud person that we all would like to look forward to. So if you need support, I am the one to support <laughs> that he should be remembered. He should be greatly remembered for what he has done for Singapore and as a leader and as a human being. Thank you. I don't know you have to, can, you, you don't have to answer any of this. <laughs> It's well, a dream, that, dream question. No. But I just wanted to say my 10 cents. Well, thank you. Th thank you for more than 10 cents. <laughs> but I would say this is a vexed issue. We've had an unhappy argument which has been public for some time. I have recused myself from all decisions concerning the House. I have left it entirely to the government, what they want to do. Uh, my deputy, uh, Mr. Teo Chi Hien, the Deputy Prime Minister, he chairs cabinet meetings and he de decides um, the government policy and actions on this matter. And he has said that, well, there's no decision to be made because my sister is living in the house. One day when she moves out from the house, the cabinet of the day will decide what they wish to do with it. And I think it is best to leave things where they are there. Imagine the idea of a leader of the. Imagine. Which is to keep the house and be a memorial for all the others, uh, for us to remember. Thank you. Thank you. I was just going to say, imagine the, the idea of a head of state deciding to recuse himself from issues involving his old family. That, that would be a strange thing to Americans. Uh, we have maybe have more time for one more question. There's a hand there. Hello, uh, I'm Martin from Estonia, and um, I think Estonia has followed um, uh, Singapore as also as a small country as good role model in Asia, and tried to build some innovative services. But uh, what you if you look for future now and then, do you have any role models globally? Any good services? Any good something you would like to learn abroad and implement in? in Singapore to make the country and the city better for, for the future next generations and so on. So what inspires you now? Well, well, certainly when it comes to IT, we look at Estonia, you have gone very far in terms of e-government, in, in terms of going cashless, in terms of going paperless, and we think there are many ideas which you have 
implemented, pioneered, which we can pick up. But others, other countries have also done this. Uh, the Chinese have uh, very successful um, Alipay and um, WeChat Pay systems, which are cashless and have completely supplanted cash in many areas. And we are trying to move in that direction. Uh, there are other areas too which we watch carefully, other countries, other cities. We have a World Waters Prize. We gave one to New York City when uh, Mr. Bloomberg was the mayor. And we watch all the winners each year because we want to learn something from them. How do they uh, manage their cities? How do they um, make it green and full of life? How do they make it orderly and yet not sterile? How do they get all the IT systems connected together so that you can, you can run the city efficiently and cost-effectively? So I think we look at many different models. I don't think there's any single one which will apply to Singapore. What we are really looking for as a magic is how do you be a small country and have the elixir of life? In other words, to be able to adapt to change, to dodge bullets, and to remain successful for a very long time to come. And the best model is Venice, which, was, uh, which thrived for 900 years. But then the world changed after, uh, the, after the, the new world was discovered and the center of gravity shifted from Central Europe to the Atlantic coast. And it still survives, but it's not what it used to be. But 900 years is not a bad run. I think what we want to do is to be able to keep on reinventing ourselves as the world changes so that 100 years from now, the next Bloomberg conference can still come to Singapore. <laughs> that, seems, that, that's, that seems a very um, appropriate moment to draw this to a conclusion in the ultimate test of Singapore government we are ending this particular session precisely on time. Thank you very much, <laughs> Thank you. Prime Minister. Thank you.